Hello again, physics friends. Today we are going to refresh our memory on how integration by parts is used and specifically how it's used in the derivation of the Euler-Lagrange equation. This is done in your text and we want to just focus on one step of the derivation where integration by parts um, comes to the rescue. So here's the setup. We have um, an integral of some function of a path y of x and its derivative dy dx, and perhaps also just of x itself integrated over x from a starting position to an ending position. Um, so this could be something like the expression for the length of a path from point A to point B, um, and y of x could be different paths, a line or a curve from point A to point B, and we're trying to extremize that length. So we have some expression like this where we have, um, we'll call this y of x, the black curve, that is the, the actual path. Um, and then we have a deviation from that, which we'll call y of x plus some deviation, which is a hypothetical path. Um, that we're trying to compare with the actual path. And if y of x is the actual path, then it's the one that extremizes this integral. And graphically, this eta of x is the vertical separation between the red curve and the black curve, because eta of x is equal to the red minus the black. Right? It's y plus eta minus y, red minus black. Okay, so when we work this out, right, we're looking for um, the, we're looking for the condition. Um, so we see that the condition to extremize uh, this integral is the following, that eta times the partial of f with respect to y plus eta prime, which is d eta dx, um, times the partial of f with respect to y prime integrated over all x has to be zero. And then what we see is that that is somehow equivalent, that same condition ends up being equivalent to the integral x1, x2. First term the same as before, and now in the second term we've moved the derivative from eta to the second term and we've changed the plus sign to a minus sign. So somehow the claim is that this integral from x1 to x2 of eta prime, which is d eta dx, times the partial with respect to y prime, that somehow equal to minus the integral from x1 to x2 of eta not primed times the derivative of that partial with respect to x now, integrated over x coordinates. So how did this come about? Where did this come from? And it turns out that this is a result that comes from integration by parts. So I just want to review integration by parts very briefly to make sure that we're clear on um, how this comes into being. So imagine we just have two functions of x, u of x and v, of x, and we decide to take the derivative of that product with respect to x. We know we're going to get a u prime v plus a u v prime by the product rule of derivatives. We could then choose to integrate um, both sides of this equation. And this would be a definite integral from, say, x1 to x2. Like so, dx. Okay. And I just noticed up here, this top right, that integral should be from x1 to x2. Okay, so we have now um, this equation. We know that the integral of the derivative of, of a function, the definite integral of a derivative of a function, is equal to that function evaluated at the limits. Okay. And then our right-hand side stays the same. So we can re-express this if we subtract 
terms from one side and bring them on to the other side, we can express this as u prime v dx integrated is equal to the product evaluated at the limits minus the integral of u v prime. Okay, And so let's see how that compares um, to this purple equation. We have integral of derivative times a new function is equal to minus the, un, um, the not derived version of eta times the derivative of the second function. So we can, we can see that in this case, if we set u to be eta and we set v to be partial of f with respect to y prime, then the equivalence holds as long as we can somehow get rid of this so-called boundary term. So let's see why that is. Okay, so here we have integral of x1 to x2 of eta prime times the partial is equal to, um, we'll leave that boundary term alone for now, integral of x1, x2 times eta multiplied by the derivative of v. So why is this term zero? If it is, then our purple equation holds. Well, if u is eta, right, so we have here eta times df dy prime evaluated at the limits. Eta, remember, is the purple, um, the difference between red and black. But at the boundaries at x1 and x2, eta is zero, right? Because we're looking for all trajectories that start at point one and end at point two. So any of these hypothetical deviations, these red curves, they all are equal to the black curve at the endpoints. Eta is zero at the endpoints. So because eta is zero at the endpoints, when you evaluate this um, boundary term, it goes to zero at the endpoints. And that, my friends, leads us to this purple equation, which is how we go from uh, an integral equation that involves eta and eta prime to one that only involves eta. And then the final step is you can factor out the eta. So let's do that. And here we have that final step. We, Using integration by parts, we've arrived at this st stage at the top right. And if we factor out the eta, then we arrive at the following expression. And the claim is that in order to extremize um, this quantity, this integral, this integral must be zero. If this integral is zero for all possible values of eta, then as we know, this term in square brackets has to individually be zero. And that condition that the term in square brackets is zero, in other words, the first partial is equal to the derivative of the second partial, that is the so-called Euler-Lagrange equation. And in the derivation of that equation, we certainly had to use this nice feature of integration by parts in order to get there. So that's it for now. This is just a quick video um, to talk about how integration by parts plays a role in the derivation of the Euler-Lagrange equations. Um, and this is a derivation that is um, followed very carefully in your textbook. So until next time, take care and be well.